You're listening to Match Point Paradox, Sports Stars Cricket Podcast. Subscribe for all new episodes and our special series, India's Greatest Cricketing Wins. In 1971, India had tamed the British cricket line in its den. It was a historic day when India beat England in the third and final test by four wickets and with 205 minutes to spare at the Kensington Oval to clinch the series 1-0. Now this victory established at least three firsts. This was the first time India won a test in England. It was also the first time in 28 tests since June 1968 that England was defeated. And it was also the first time that India triumphed in two series in one year, having defeated the West Indies earlier. The report of this match published in the pages of the Hindu on August 24, 1971 is linked in the description of this episode. Do check it out. One of the fulcrums of this Indian effort at the Oval was Farooq Engineer. Now 83, the veteran Indian cricketer looks back at that memorable victory with fondness as he joins Vijay Lokpali in this episode. Hailing it as the victory that really kick-started Indian cricket's rise in the world, Engineer talks about that match. parallels that he sees between himself and Rishabh Pant and the impact of money on the game and its elements sir um uh, your immediate memories i mean obviously you have spoken thousand times about those uh, that wonderful moment uh, what does come, what, what is it that comes to your mind today as we speak well uh, that i'd like to think that we were the pioneers of uh, most people somehow seem to think that only indian cricket sort of started flourishing after 83 yes you know but i mean they're sadly mistaken because in 71 we beat the west indies in the west indies we beat australia you know we beat england in england so i mean we've had a lot of successes before that yes sir you know and i'd like to think that we sort of started the you know the progression yeah of 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 indian cricket taken away from the 83 world cup victory i saw the film and i enjoyed yeah. it immensely especially baman irani my dear friend playing my role as i was the only indian commentator yeah but one thing they forgot to mention in it was that uh, mrs gandhi was the prime minister those days and um Brian Johnston jokingly asked me the would Mrs Gandhi declare a public holiday as India was just about to win you know yeah. about half a minute from the win and I said funny you say that she's an avid test match special listener as if she had the time to listen to you know commentary yeah. I said I have no doubt at all that she will declare a public holiday within 10 minutes 10 15 minutes we got a phone call through to BBC headquarters and onto the Lord's cricket ground in the commentator's box that mrs gandhi has in fact heard your comments and declared a public holiday <laughs> you know i mean uh, you just say a thing in a little box yes on the top on the in the turret of lords yeah. in the commentator's box and is picked up all over the world yes so it's it's quite frightening you know that uh, it's quite surreal that something like this happened but uh, i remember when it all started really Okay, okay, I got the highest score in the first innings. Yeah. You know, and um, I like I was the most experienced player in English wickets. So I, yes. it was up to me to to guide you know our bats on how to go about it, which they did. I mean, we had some great players like Vishy, Vishwanath was a superb player and you know and, and everyone, but I mean um, Sunil Gavaskar had just come from his previous exploits in the West Indies and all that. But I said this is different here. The ball moves in the air and off the pitch. Yeah. And Ray Ellingworth is a very, very shrewd captain, perhaps the shrewdest captain England have ever had. You know, and he, we didn't have video, sort of, you know, but he knew everything in his mind exactly, and especially he knew my game inside out. Yeah. Because he was Yorkshire captain, and I was Lancashire. You know, so we played a lot against each other. Yeah. And I got a lot of runs against Yorkshire, so. So I mean, um, although we were chasing score and all that, and when wickets fell, when Vishwanath was out, 
and Abid Ali came in. You know, I think there was about four runs left to win or something. Hmm. Yes. Uh, three or four runs left. Yes, sir. And I told Abid, don't do anything daft. Don't do anything stupid. Don't throw your wicket away. Because after you, there's Bishan, Venkat and Chandra, they don't know which side of the bat to hold. <laughs> you know, and we'll bring them back into the game. Yeah. So don't do anything, anything, anything silly. There is no need. There's plenty of time. Yes, and sir. If we lose a wicket, then you'll bring them back into the game. Their heads are down at the moment, you know, and uh, you're the last recognized sort of batsman. So okay, okay, Abid Ali. First ball, he charges down the wicket, trying to hit. <laughs> I think Derek Underwood out of the ground or something like that. Misses it, and Alan not to fall. People, I think this is a fairly easy stumping. Yeah. And that was the last ball of the over. I said, Abida, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, three, four runs are Yes. We'll bring them back into the game otherwise. I've not hit a single four. I've been really trying to, you know, we must win this game. We, we, we can't afford to bring them back in the game. Yeah. You don't get a chance like this. So next over, first ball, I think I took... A, I took a single, and as I was taking a single, hmm. I realized, am I doing the wrong thing here? Yeah. You know, by giving up with the strike, which, you know, two or three runs left. Yes. Again, I went up to him. I said, Abid, don't do anything stupid. No need for the... But Abid is Abid after all, you know. Yeah. He had in his mind that he wanted to hit the winning run or something, you know. Oh. Which never even occurred to me. It never even crossed my head. Yeah. You know, who wins the, who is the winning run? As yeah. long as India win, that was the main thing. Yes. Anyway, I mean, I'm not taking any credit away from Abida. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah, not at all. Because he's my very dear friend. I, I mean, same time, same thing. He jumped out and I think he hit in the covers. And um, it was in the gap. But the, he didn't even hit the ball very hard because the ball wouldn't have traveled to the boundary. But yeah. the Indian spectators absolutely engulfed the field. They all oh. came in, you know, oh. and, and the English fielders trying to protect themselves. They ran <laughs> to uh, another way towards the pavilion. Yes. You know, and uh, this, this, is, this, this is what happened. In fact, after the game, hmm. one of the spectators ran onto the field. He said, Mr. Engineer, you have won this match for India and I've got this ball, huh. the, the cricket ball. Yeah. And I would, I, I would love, love to keep you as a souvenir. But I would like to give it to you because you are the one who deserves it. Yes. I said, thank you very much. And I still got that ball with me. Oh, know? great. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. So, I mean, um, so, I mean, and, and of course, we won. There were ticker tape, welcome, Ajit. And all the boys flew back to, to Bombay for a big open bus reception and all that. But we had one, you know, we hardly got paid any money those days. Yeah. So an Indian restaurant invited us for a meal. You know, some sh champagne we are on the ground and some meal. So I, and by the time it was the celebrations and all that, it was like eight, nine o'clock yeah. already in, in the night. You know, and I think the team were taking a flight that night, same night. Yes. But I had to drive back to Manchester because I was contracted only to play in the test matches. Correct. Because next day there was a Lancashire-Yorkshire game. Right. Very important game. And I said, I must, you know, I, I will be there. So the restaurant, I didn't have time to eat at the restaurant. I told them, Bhai, just give me, you know, a quarter of tandoori chicken in a, in a silver foil, you know. Yeah. And as I drive to Manchester, I will, I, I will eat it. Yeah. And there were no motorways those days. Because all, there was M6. Do you know England well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've been there for okay, five There was an M6 and then there was M1. M1 yeah. went from London to Scotland, but M6 went from Manchester to London, but in a different way. So mm. in between, there was an A5, which is like a one hour's journey, one and a half mm. hour's journey, longer. Nowadays, it's motorways, of course, yeah. throughout, you know. But those days, so so I reached home at like almost one o'clock, two two o'clock in the morning because there was some traffic on the road also, you know. And um, I was conscious that ten o'clock I've got to 
you know, nine o'clock, I've got to report to Old Trafford for a 10 o'clock start match. And of course, Lancashire won the toss and Yorkshire, you know, invited us to bat. And they told me, they said, especially the Farouk, we knew you'd be tired from your journey and we wanted to get you out as soon as, you know, <laughs> so we, yes. there was a bit of ploy in that. And I yes. think Jeff Boycott was the one who was instrumental in that. Yeah. But luckily I got some I, I got some runs. But what strikes out when I went out to open the innings with Bumble Lloyd, David Lloyd. You know, yeah. The whole Old Trafford Stadium, which you see behind me here, hmm. and that's Old Trafford. Yeah. That's got up and gave me a standing ovation. Oh, lovely. And I thought these people and not one Indian amongst them. Yeah. These all English people, I've just shafted their country the day before. Yeah. Literally the night before. And these same people are giving me a standing ovation, which I was really touched, you know. Yes. So this was, yeah. you know, this yeah. was it. And uh, of course, I wasn't aware of all the celebrations that were going on in India. You know, the boys sent me photographs and all that. Yes. And said, yeah. I wish I wish I was there too, you know. So nobody is proud of being an Indian more than I am. Yeah. Although I'm not on Indian soil physically, my heart all the time, all the time is in India, always has been. Yes. And always will be. Yes. You know. Sir, how could a flamboyant batsman like you who gets 94 in a test match before land hit a 50 without a boundary? Well, good question. Because when I got 94 before lunch, that was the first morning of a test match. Yeah. In this case, it was the penultimate day of the test match. Yeah. And we had to win the test match. There was nobody after me. That day I'd opened the innings. This on this occasion I didn't open the innings. Yeah. So a lot of responsibility less on my shoulders. And I think every time Rishab Pant charges down the wicket and throws the wicket away, uh -huh. he should be shown my innings there. That look here, I could have done that. Yes. But no. You, you play for your country. Yes. I'm not saying Rishab is not playing for his country. Please don't get me wrong. I don't want to be misconstrued here. No. Because again, Rishab, I'm a huge admirer of Rishab. Yeah. You know, but I just wish you would you would just buckle down a bit, you know, yeah. think about the situation. People used to say the same thing about me because I used to play some silly shots and, <laughs> you know, I used to like hitting the ball and hitting it hard. Yes. And, and uh, But uh, there are occasions when you don't do that. There are occasions when you, you know, and you mature. And it is only you who can control your mind there. Yes. So, so that's the reason I buckled down and I knew that I can't afford to play a risky shot here because I will let my country down. Yes. And I just couldn't afford to do that. Yeah, correct. Sir, I mean, I remember this. I, I've written down 39 runs were needed. When you joined uh, Gundabha Vishwanath. Something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how was it batting with Vishwanath? I mean, we have only, we have heard, we have read, we have seen uh, very little of him. I watched the 1969, that was my first test match at Delhi against the Australians. So how, how was it batting with him? Oh, great. Absolutely. Vishy was one of the finest batsmen in our Indian team. Little fellow, but he packed a strong punch. Yeah. You know, and the... The one of the most delightful fellows in the team. Yes. You know, all the boys from from South India or from anywhere, you know, the the, the South Indian contingent were the spinners, Chandra. Chandra Sekhar, I have the utmost, 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 utmost highest regard for him. Yes. Because he made a problem. He made a, a defect of his polio yeah. into a huge asset. Mm. You know, only a man with great willpower, great character, and great forward thinking would do that. And that is why Chandra will always be, in my opinion, as yeah. India's finest spinner ever. Yeah. You know, because he made his he made his defect into an enormous advantage. Yeah. He didn't know himself which way the ball was going quite a few times. I had to tell him, Chandra. When he tried to bowl a leg break and he got a big googly and he bowled the bat, so I said, Chandra, 
you try to bowl a leg break that is yes he said you know such an unassuming guy yes you know he yes. didn't always realize because of his action but i used to see the way he used to grip the ball in his fingers the way it left his fingers yeah in the air and off the pitch like a split second computerized effect it was yeah that's the only way he could keep wickets to chandra yeah you know and to keep wickets to him on the last day of a test match to a left hander like gary sobers or clive lloyd mm-hmm. where the ball pitches in the bowler's foot marks you know and and with chandra not knowing which way the ball is going to spin and he bowled pretty quick chandra was pretty quick you know he bowled about good 85 90k so i mean and the ball spinning viciously that yeah. was wicket keeping at its best at its most challenging and that's when i really relished keeping wickets to him because so many op- opportunities were there you know sir and walikar's role as a captain in the entire series and especially this match where he was sleeping when the runs were being scored <laughs> ajit and tiger yeah. both in my period uh, they were officially appointed captains but i used to do 90% of the captaincy oh so there is something for about... both yes for both because we had a great understanding hmm. we hardly spoke about it but just our eyes met a bowling change eyes met a fielder here eknath solkar there you know it was it was our combination and it was i shouldn't be saying that i'm not demeaning either captain the both very good captains yeah but i did 90% of their captaincy yeah you know they they just left it to me to a great if they were alive they would have said that themselves you know but this, this you know they said time and again that um, so this was a thing you know due to politics i was never officially i was officially appointed captain in fact for the west indies tour yeah. you know when gavaskar got those runs yes and i was invited to mumbai to be sort of um, co-opted on the committee yeah. to pick the team when one or two people took objection you know that i live in england i'm playing for lancashire so why should i captain india i said clive lloyd is captaining the west indies and he's my roommate for lancashire never doubt it he thought we would be flamboyant you know for some reason to be flamboyant was a crime in in his in his book he left dour and you know but okay you can't please everybody in this world Yeah. that was my character i couldn't change my you know my my character yeah when i did something i did it with a style i'd like to think i was never i never did it artificially no. it came naturally you know so i mean um, when you have the confidence you do that sometimes you know and um, it could be misunderstood in certain quarters and obviously it didn't go down well with the you know then chairman of selectors so anyway but i always give my 110% to whichever captain because yeah. they knew that i should really have been the captain you know with my experience and the, the, but so that's why they had that respect and not yeah. to demean them we didn't make a public show of it that i was controlling things behind the scenes yeah you know but i was you know i knew stay from behind the stumps you know what a batsman is doing what a batsman's strengths and weaknesses are what a bowler is doing how much he's turning how much is troubling the batsman so from wicket keeper's angle you know exactly what is happening so you're the best person any captain would guide his or should guide his wicket keeper and wicket keeper should give him correct advice you know right. nowadays with drs referrals and all that the wicket keeper is in the best position yeah and it surprises me that sometimes you know we do some crazy reviews when there is no chance of getting and the wicket keeper there should be more mature and think that no captain yeah. why we waste it it's not you know worth it this should obviously not out the ball didn't hit his bat it came off his pads or his trouser or the the ball was not lbw we could have gone over the wickets so wicket keeper has an exact idea what happening you know so he should be the best person to yeah that's so would you there. yeah would you say the 71 Uh, when of course in 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 when the west indies and england especially uh, yeah. was it the finest hour 
I, I, even today, I feel that is the finest hour of Indian cricket. I may be. I'd old. like to think so. Yeah. I'd like to think so. I mean, a lot of people may not agree, but I was partisan to that. So they might think that, you know, but if you think so, I agree with you entirely. That was the starting point. That was the time when I instilled in our players. Our players started believing that we can beat these Goras. Yeah. You know, we can beat these English people. We can beat Australia. We can beat England. We are good enough. We don't want to be pushed around by them. Yeah. Again, sledging. The Australians used to sledge us. You know, South Africa, we didn't play against, so we don't know then. But I played in county cricket against one or two, you know, Zimbabwe guys, you know, and, uh, and they thought they were really, a little bloody Zimbabwe thought they were superior to India just because they were the fairer than us, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, the sooner you put them in the place, the more they respect you. You know? Yes. yes. I mean, some great Australian players have tried to sledge us and all that, and, but I've just given it back to them. Yeah. I've paid them with, with a bat yes. more, more than anything else and told them to get lost, you know, sort of. So this gave confidence to our other junior players, yeah. like Gavaskar, Vishwanath, and all that. They thought that Farooq's not taking this lying down. Why should we take it lying down? Why should we take it? Why should we be humiliated? You know, for no reason at all. Yes. Just because of the color of our skin, you know, that is not on. So, I mean, um, so not only on the field, but off the field also. Our, started players, our players started getting more confident. You know, and confidence is half the battle when you go out in the middle. If you go out looking with your head down, that'll go, they'll pump the bowlers up that this fellow is out before he's even walked to the crease. Yeah. But if you walk out showing that, come on, you can only, you got a ball in your hand, I've got a bat. You can only bowl one ball to me at a time. You know, let's see what you can do. Let's see what I can do. So go with that confident approach to them yeah. so that they don't get, you know, Otherwise, you're giving them a superiority advantage. At what point in, in the test match did you really think, oh, now we have had them. We are going to have them. We are going to win this game. Well, when we got them out at, yeah. at the Oval. You know, when we got them out and we had to get those runs, I, did, I told the boys, we have to get them. You know, we got plenty of time. There's no need for any bravados, no need for any unnecessary heroics. Let's just stick to basics. You know, and let let's let's get the first first ten runs, then the first twenty runs, first thirty runs. The deficit is going to reduce all the time, and when the deficits get under hundred, they'll start panicking, and that is exactly what happened. So we took it stage by stage. You know, every time we go 10, 20 runs, ten twenty runs, that was a milestone that we reached, and that's how. I knew when I went in to bat that I would get the runs, no problem at all. They had to stay with me. Somebody had to stay with me, you know. So, sir, uh, has it struck you in the last few years? I mean, since two thousand eight, that you would have been a big, big hit in the IPL with your flamboyant. Well, they always tell me. All, all, all my colleagues tell me the Lipping Saga and all. All the all, I didn't play with the, the much junior to me. But they all tell me, Gavaskar, everyone, that you would have been by far the highest earner in IPL. We Money never entered our head. Yeah. We played for the pride of playing for India and for the love of cricket. I just loved the game. I just loved cricket. you know. And I thought playing for India is a huge bonus. We didn't get money. We got, we got when we toured, we got, I paid, I played test cricket at 250 rupees for a five-day test match. 50 rupees a day we got. And myself and I think Sunil or someone was batting, or Patodi or something, I, I can't remember, against New Zealand. We're, we're, we're winning and we had about two hours, or no, we had about 45 minutes or an hour to get about 20 runs. And the way we were going, we could have easily finished the game on the fourth day. So all sorts of messages were coming from the dressing room. You speak Hindi, na? Aaj game mat karo, hamara kal ka 50 rupees jayenge. 
So we started blocking. <laughs> you know, it was difficult not to not to get edges also start blocking. Yes. Some of our three or four runs were left for next day. What a cheer from the dressing room. You know, that we didn't finish the game that evening because each player would have lost 50 rupees. Yes. Those, those you know, that those are the times. Nowadays they're corrode party, you know, they're, they're just millionaires, multi-millionaires, which yeah. I'm very happy. Yeah. What makes me happy is that guys from poor villages, out of towns, as the one is a rickshaw driver's son, yeah. the fast bowler. And he, the first thing he did was buy his parents a house. Yeah. You know, now when you hear stories like that, your heart bleeds. And you say, I'm so glad that this guy's earned this, his parents, he respects his parents. And so that's the way it should be, really, you know. Right. So I'm very happy that they're earning millions these days. May they continue to earn. But we never, we never even thought about money. Okay. So you know, 50 rupees a day. And whenever people used to invite us for dinner, you know, we used to get one pound a day when we toured England or so and and that so people used to invite us for dinner to their homes. So we used to say not only can I come, but can I bring three or four players along with me? <laughs> you know, because their allowances also. Yes. They also loved having cricketers and all that, you know. Yes, yes, yes. One thing I remember in our time, especially with me and Pataudi, we were invited to people like Talat Mahmood, Mohammad Rafi, Mukesh, you know, um, some of the greats, Lata Mangeshkar, Kishore Kumar, to the homes for dinner. Yeah. You know, and they used to take a harmonium and play the songs, put in our names in the songs as well as a joke. And me and Pataudi used to take a coin and play tabla to oh. his music, completely murdering their music, you know. <laughs> but we used to enjoy, used to have a couple of drinks and have a laugh. And, I, and then I think, and after a while, we should say, Are, bhook lagi, khana nikalo karke. <laughs> we had the opportunity of seeing these guys two, three feet from us. Yeah. Playing for us only. Yes. You know, and now they're all, when we hear those, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s music, nostalgic guzzles and all that, I consider myself so lucky that we were actually there. Yeah. You know, with, with them. Sir, did you and, at any point get an offer to work in a film? I'm yes. sure you would have. Yes, I was offered a, a contract, but my dad was very quite strict. He was a doctor. Mm -hmm. My dad was a doctor by profession. And of course, his name was Dr. Engineer, which you don't see the funny side of it till you grow up, you know. <laughs> but dad was the captain of his Grand Medical College team right. in, in, in Bombay. So he and my brother, my brother was Darius. These two were primarily instrumental in my in my career. My mother, I lost my mother at a very young age. Oh. She never saw me play test cricket. And I just worshipped my parents. Yeah. I, you know, with my God, I worship my parents every day, morning and before I go to bed. You know what I say? I say thank you. I just say thank you. Don't ask for anything. Thank you for all you've done for me. Because they sacrificed their lives to make me, you know, somebody of me. My brother was a far better cricketer than I was. But oh. he was, Darash, yeah, he played for Mysore, Ranji Trophy, captain them and all that. And university, he should have played test cricket easily hmm. as a brilliant off spinner and a batsman, brilliant all, all rounder. But again, politics were in the way. So he was got a bit fed up. He went to England. And he was partly responsible for designing Heathrow and Gatwick airports. You know? oh, he, he was so highly skilled in his structural engineering, really. You know? okay. Yeah, very highly Sir, respected. I won't let you go before you tell us the Brill Cream story. <laughs> well, uh, that came out of the blue. Brill Cream, there was one Dennis Compton from England who was a double international soccer and football, and absolutely the, the pin-up boy of England. Another pin-up boy of Australia was Keith Miller, Nugget. You know, the most good-looking guy ever played cricket for Australia and all that. And these two were the two Brill Cream models. And to be asked to be the third Brill Cream model, it's like being asked to be James Bond or something. <laughs> you know, 
to be asked to be advertised for Brill Cream was like being on the cover of Vogue magazine those days, which was the all world thing, you know, and I couldn't believe it that they asked me. And um, throughout my career, I was a, I was a Brill Cream. I never bought for any other hair, hair cream, you know, that was one of the conditions. Yeah, yeah. And, and they paid me, I, I think, 500 pounds more if I played batted without a cap, which I did in any case. <laughs> you know, I never wore a cap or a helmet. Yes. Really, while, while batting. Yes. And it didn't suit me. I was, so Brilfrim loved that, you know, all, all these things. Yeah. And all my friends used to say, Are real cream bag bottle milega cap? It was quite expensive. Yes. And my mom used to say, Where are we going to keep all these boxes of Brill cream? I said, Bottle care, dabba le jao. <laughs> so, yes. I never used the stuff, but most of my, all my friends used it. Right? Yeah. But, but sir, uh, when yeah. you miss India, what do you do? I, India is always in my heart. You know, over here, I watch, if, if I watch the BBC news, I make sure I watch NDTV or Republic News or, you know, I want to keep in touch with what's happening in my country at every moment in time. So India, I eat, drink and sleep Indian. If anyone says one wrong word against India or against our Indians, I chew them up alive here, you know? Yes. Yeah. How dare you talk about my country like that? Tell it. Okay. You see, we were all bloody Indians when, when we were playing. There were, a lot of people are young enough not to realize that. Yeah. You know, but we as older people, I will be 84. Oh. In, in, yeah. On yeah. 25th of February. Okay. So in, in less than a month. Yes, yes, yes. And I've enjoyed every minute of my 84 years. You know, I just pray to God that... And I'm just beginning to get a few heart problems. I think I've got to have an open heart surgery shortly, you know. Oh. But, uh, but um, you know, this is all, it just, it's just happening now. So, but I enjoy, in turn enjoy every bit of my life. And I would urge people to do the same because you never know when your number is called up. You know, with COVID, losing friends, yeah. losing relatives, it has been so hard. For all over the world, people all over the world, not only for us Indians, but all over the world, you know. So I think you got to look at life realistically and think that, you know, we're so lucky to be around. Yeah. And so any message for young Indian cricketers? Yes, be positive. Think positive. Think, be confident. Don't let any of the guys put you down for no reason. They're all playing games to put you down, to undermine your self-respect. Our self-respect is the most important thing. You know, look them straight in the face and be proud. Be proud Indians because we are a very proud nation. Thank you for listening in to this special episode of India's Greatest Cricketing Wins. Our first episode featured C.D. Gopinath, who relived India's first ever test victory back in 1952. That episode is linked in the description. Subscribe to Matchpoint Paradox so you don't miss a single episode from Sportstar's Cricket Podcast. Until our next episode where we sit down with yet another glorious moment from Indian cricketing history, take care and stay safe.